biodiversity, the number of species and the variety between them, is declining faster than at any time in human history. We depend on biodiversity for food, medicines, energy, clean air and water, security from natural disasters. It is part of our culture. It supports all systems of life on Earth. Each species has its own value and has taken millions of years to evolve. Biodiversity benefits are often unexpected, like the medical uses of the blood of the horseshoe crab. But nature is not external to us. The environment is what we live in. Without forests, clean oceans and rivers, the planet would be uninhabitable. In some areas, like the deep oceans, thousands of species have yet to be discovered. Worldwide, a million species are threatened with extinction, mainly through habitat loss, but also over-exploitation, pollution, invasive species, and now climate change. 59% of large mammals, amphibians, birds, reptiles and fish are under threat. Two out of every five plant species are threatened with extinction. We are in the middle of the sixth greatest mass extinction in world history. Biodiversity and climate change affect each other. Ocean warming kills coral reefs. Acid oceans threaten shellfish. Bush and forest fires and deforestation raise emissions and threaten rare species. Melting permafrost and polar ice could lead to climate tipping points, as well as devastating species and communities that depend on them. There are huge efforts worldwide to save individual species and protect their habitats. Kew Gardens Millennium Seed Bank is working with 97 countries and territories across seven continents to save 2.4 billion seeds from over 40,000 plant species for the future. In 2022, 188 countries came together to sign the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, a new treaty to protect biodiversity. They pledged to take urgent action to halt and reverse biodiversity loss, to put nature on a path to recovery for the benefit of people and the planet. The Global Biodiversity Framework pledges to halt human-induced extinctions by 2050 and to protect 30% of key areas of land and oceans by 2030. It would share the DNA benefits of biodiversity with indigenous peoples, finance support for transition economies, drastically reduce pollution, pesticides and subsidies harmful to biodiversity. The new treaty aims to turn species loss and mass extinction around and to produce a whole worldwide recovery in biodiversity. The treaty depends for its effect on political will, national legislation and effective monitoring and enforcement. What can we do to help our governments live up to their promises on biodiversity? We can turn the spotlight on whether biodiversity has the legislation, the people, resources and political support that it needs. There is not much time to lose.
What can the learning we do in classrooms contribute to helping the planet achieve net zero? How can climate change in curriculum impact the race to net zero? What systemic measures do you think should be taken to ensure that language is not a barrier to the global transfer? What adjustments, if any, should be made by governments regarding their carbon six commitment? The alternative strategies, you know, that you think government should reconsider. What are the most important things that Mexico must do in order to achieve uh, the net zero goals? You want to establish the Gamma Ethiopian Meteorological Station. How is this helping the situation? How to place the net cost climate change will cause the and retreat to disappear altogether. Many people are lobbying for an increased rate of ice melting in search of methane and other gas reserves. What are your thoughts on this? If you look at the UK and other nations around the world facing the net zero challenge, how far are we from reaching the level of sustainable sources of energy needed to replace fossil fuels? We don't want people to simply have passive knowledge. We want people to feel empowered. We want people to be advocates for change. We want people to know how to go out and make a difference in the world and band together. And that can only take place through uh, environments that are learning by doing environments and that teach you not just about ecosystems, but about how ecosystems are shaped by the world. We need a partnership approach between education and other stakeholders in society, or other stakeholders in government, other stakeholders in, in society, in particular, uh, the alliance between education ministries, the education sector, and environment ministries. Uh, the environment sector is, is, is crucial, really, to, to, to move the agenda. I joined the UN Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. I learned that uh, the 61 languages account for less than half the world's speaking population, and some of the world's largest research reports, like the IPCC report, are only available in the UN languages. And in addition to that, 75% of the world doesn't speak English, but 80% of scientific literature is only available in English. And so I just generally learned that there was an issue of language accessibility, specifically as it pertained to climate. And I wanted to make a difference to make sure that as many people as possible could access crucial climate resources. The Arctic is changing, is changing rapidly. And many of the species that are dependent on sea ice are struggling or even uh, vanishing. 带着这些中国的年轻人们，我们一定要到一线，到自然里面去，然后去这些退化的一些山地，退化的这个海岸线，我们带着他们去种树。呃，当然这种树不是一个特别简单的一个过程，我们希望就是有更多的青年人通过自
for a country such as ours that is wholly reliant on coal. We have to ensure that this is not simply a talk shop. While the pledge at COP26 is a step in the right direction, we must see this funding manifest and be used in a responsible way. We're in a much better place than we, than we were three, four years ago. There has been a real, real acceleration in sort of awareness, which has a lot to do with youth movements and the, and the pressure from, from young people. That's really been transformative. Start to value, place a value on the land. And therefore, if we place a real value on it, then the relationship between the people and the land would change. Finding alternatives, taking to renewable energy, talking about electric cars and all that and all that. So we have a duty, an abiding duty to work towards transiting to next zero and in good time so that we are not left with critical national assets like our oil and gas being abandoned. We recognize as young people in Egypt and globally the importance of human rights as well as climate justice. At COP27, it's going to take space to talk about all these different issues, uh, both that affect young people in Egypt and globally, and we were able to uh, do that at COP. With highlights from numerous Net Zero video and podcast episodes, this production offers key takeaways from activists engaged with global experts on critical topics related to global warming and climate crisis. Be inspired by the passionate voices of young people, their dedication, wisdom and commitment to monitoring the world's progress toward a sustainable future. The pace of change over the past 50 years has been extraordinary. The global economy has expanded fourfold. Over a billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty and will live significantly longer and childbirth mortality has significantly dropped. However, this 19th and 20th century model of economic growth has come at a significant cost to nature. Globally, nature is declining at the rates unprecedented in human history, with up to one million species at risk of extinction, largely due to human activity. Since 1970, there has been a 60% average population decline across all vertebrate species. Over the same period, we have lost more than half of the world's coral and over a third of all wetlands. Meanwhile, greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, both intensifying extreme weather events and nature loss and putting effort to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement further, of course. Biodiversity loss is one of the top five risks in terms of impact and likelihood over the coming decade. For the first time in planetary history, humans are the driver of climate and environmental change, or what is being called by scientists as the Anthropocene. Earth system scientists and researchers predict that if the current rates of nature destruction continue unabated, some biomes, example the tundra, grasslands, coral reef, forest and desert, may come, may cross irreversible tipping points. UK economist Partha Dasgupta has acknowledged, and I quote, we economists see nature when we see it at all as a backdrop from which resources and services can be drawn in isolation, unquote. The challenges of nature loss are both wicked and non-linear. No single business and no single human on this planet can decouple its dependency from nature. $44 trillion of economic value generation, over half the world's total GDP, is moderately or highly dependent on nature and its services and therefore exposed to risk from nature loss. Industrial scale fisheries and other unsustainable practices have further exposed economies and societal well-being to nature-related risk. There is an urgent need to reset humanity's relationship with nature, especially our oceans, in as much as over 70% of the total ocean surface is outside jurisdiction. Nature is essential to both global economic prosperity and individual business success. 
We cannot have a sustainable future for people, especially young people and economies, if we do not address nature, climate and people in an integrated way. Unfortunately, shareholder capitalism and profits have been built on the destruction of the natural world. If corporations are willing to go beyond economic generation and serve their purpose in fulfilling human and societal aspirations as part of the broader social system and champion a shared and regenerative economy for all its stakeholders, then we need to prioritize the most vital social and economic stakeholder to, for survival and regenerated development, planet Earth. Dear friends, nature is an entrepreneurial system whose ecosystem services have been conducting research and development for billions of years. The cost equivalent of humanity replicating nature system is incomparable. The Nature Action Agenda calls for a movement to disrupt business as usual approaches, halt biodiversity loss by 2030 and restore the planet's vital systems. To do so, we need a fundamental shift from businesses and governments in our foundational relationship with nature. In the natural world, we can find different types of ecological relationships, whether they are mutualistic relationships between species, where we have a win-win situation, commensal relationships, relationships win-neutral, or parasitic relationships, win-lose. Although, even in nature, parasitic relationships can sometimes serve the long-term interest and the broader health of an ecosystem. Unfortunately, the predominant relationship that businesses and government have with the primary natural stakeholders is often parasitic and one that has proven to be disruptive for all ecosystems. In the coming UN decade on ecosystem restoration, our challenge is to shift our primary relationship with the natural world from a parasitic to a collaborative and regenerative relationship with our planetary stakeholders. For the marine environment, there is already an incredible new wave of innovators who have taken the approach of forming public planet partnerships with the natural stakeholders, such as the partnering with the ocean currents to clean the Great Pacific garbage patch. All inclusive stakeholder approach for nature also calls on government and corporations to invest in the development of frameworks that protect the legal rights of nature so that the planet cannot be exploited and so that stakeholders' value is shared across species and ecosystem. Here, I have a special thoughts for our mangroves as they bear the onslaught of the oil spills from the MV Wakashio. I think that by now, the whole world is aware that the MV Wakashio, a Japanese carrier with thousands of gallons of fuel, has hit our reef on the 25th of July of this year, and oil has started to leak on the 6th of August 2020. This ship has soiled our marine park and another Ramsar protected area where unique plants and animals have been living for thousands of years. Many endemic species of plants and animals are now at risk. Our mangroves are now covered with oil slick and increasing our coral reef vulnerability. Mangroves can sequester up to 10 times as much of carbon pollution as rainforest. They help defend against flooding, grow up miraculously on seawater, fringe some of the tropical shores where they help anchor shorelines and protect the coast from the devastating impacts of storm waves. They are much more effective than concrete seawalls. Mangroves shelter a wealth of wildlife, protecting more than 3,000 species, many of which are of commercial importance. Despite all these benefits, mangroves tend to be undervalued and 11 of some 70 mangrove species are at risk of becoming extinct. Every year, the environment provides about 125 trillion US dollars in free services, for example, pollination, water filtration, oxygen production, and flood protection. This is worth more than the entire global GDP. Coral reefs are home to so many species, but they are often called, and they are often called, the rainforest of the sea. Today, they face a daunting range of threats, including ocean warming, acidification, overfishing, and pollution. Worldwide, more than one third of all coral species are at risk of extinction. Corals are in trouble and they aren't down for the count yet. Oh, that's, that's good news. In 2019, the United Nations reported that around one million 
animal and plant species are threatened with extinction, and many of them within decades. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last century, we have become out of balance with nature. Today, 96% mammals are human beings and are domesticated livestock. In the ocean, 90% of the large fish, from sharks to tuna to cod, have been removed in the last 100 years. The biggest drivers of biodiversity loss in the ocean is when we have been taking fish out of water, of water faster than they can reproduce. And today, 63% of fish stocks are experiencing overfishing. The planet is like a bank account where every living thing pays in deposits, but we are the one species that have kept withdrawing from us. Over, our overuse of our natural resources is costing us six trillion US dollars every year. And by 2050, those costs could rise to 28 trillion US dollars. Perhaps the harnessing power of their remaining biodiversity can give them a fighting chance, just like for other creatures, big and small. I thank you for your attention. At the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, I was a colleague of Dr. Pachuri in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and also a little bit away from the IPCC. So we're dealing with climate change. This means it's especially important for the youth and the next generation. So I now live in New Zealand. I'm originally from New Zealand and there have been two major multi-billion dollar disasters in New Zealand associated with climate change over the past year. One of them was a Cyclone Gabriel and, uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars in damage. Patchy was a leader in the IPCC and the need to address climate change, but he was attacked by some, and I've suffered a little bit from that as well, and it's especially related to vested interests in the fossil fuel industry. But he stood tall throughout all of this. I'm pleased to see that this pop festival and uh, his message is not lost. I urge you all to do what you can to help address climate change and protect our planet. Thank you very much. My friends, thank you for gathering together for a cause that will help billions the world over and future generations. Thank you for letting me, Jonathan Granoff, president of the Global Security Institute, uh, great, grateful for the privilege of serving with you. Thank you for letting me share some thoughts with you. And thank you, Dr. Ash Bachawi, for inviting me and bringing us all together. Pop, what a great name. It does honor to your father, your father who was wise and extremely practical and who brought the world, helped bring the world to an awareness of one of the crises that we face collectively that should bring us together that must bring us together, that must awaken us to a new level of global awareness. He had that awareness and he brought the wisdom of that awareness into action. Protecting the living systems of our planet. That's what, it, that's what climate protection is about. Now these living systems are integrated. The rainforests, the oceans, Climate and us are part of one integrated living system. 60% of our oxygen comes from the phytoplankton of the oceans, which is dependent on the climate. The system of life on the planet is integrated. That is a reality. And us as human beings, we're just one thread in this system. But our impact is putting the entire system at risk. And we each have a part to play in protecting it. How can we call ourselves fully human if we're going to leave a legacy of suffering for future generations? Are we not born as one family, first and foremost? Is our common humanity to be ignored? Shall we continue to fight over identities of our own creation? Nations, religions, caste, class, race, creed, ideology? I think that the compelling reason before us at this moment in human history should place our humanity, our common humanity, first and foremost. 
The challenge before us today to protect the climate, the ecosystems of the planet, requires nations and peoples to change and to work together to achieve that change. This requires an understanding, a deep understanding or deep commitment that the human family is one. And there's an ancient spiritual insight from the Upanishads memorialized over the Parliament of India, reminding us, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. And that's not just a spiritual admonition today. Today, understanding its practical implications is a necessity. Today, our very survival actually requires an enlivened consciousness of this understanding. India wisely labeled the recent G70, One Earth, One Family, One Future. Dr. Rajendra Pachali exemplified bringing an awareness of this insight into action and his son Ash is amplifying the power of that awareness today with POP, with us. It's an honor to remind you of what you already know. I say these truths so that we can work better together. We must collectively persuade our politicians, decision makers, and you, the youth, you will be the decision makers soon. That it is not a diminution of sovereignty to work collectively with other nations. There's no other way to obtain a sustainable future. The first duty of every state is to protect its citizens. And that today can only be achieved at a global level. Pandemics don't carry passports. And now we've made weapons, nuclear weapons, that not only create a unnecessary adversity and institutionalize that adversity, building on fear and terror, but they very, very literally threaten the climate with fast burn. And our industrial processes are threatening the climate with slow burn. And in each instance, it shows a disrespect for the great mystery of the gift of life, the gift of this amazing journey that we share together in this wondrous planet, in the infinite universe. Now, there may be other places where there's, where there's life. There may be. We don't know. But we do know that on this planet there is life and there is love. And it is worth our effort to protect it. And never before has every single one of us be, been affected by these global phenomena. Pandemics don't carry passports. Nuclear radiation doesn't have boundaries. And the climate certainly cannot be under, identified as an American climate or the Indian climate or Pakistani or Chinese or Russian climate. It's one climate. Planetary realism. best way to achieve human security. We are the realists. This task of working beyond borders to protect a borderless climate will require each of us to have hearts without borders. And I urge each of you to develop skills of excellence to bring those hearts, your hearts, into action. Ash's leadership with the POP movement, is an example of using skills wisely to address this global threat. But each of us has to think, what is the wisdom that our elders have given us? Like the Upanishads, the world is one family. And also, what is it that our conscience tells us? I believe that if we look deeply in our conscience, It'll ask us to bring our highest values into action. And I can assure you that if you make the effort to do that, your life will have fulfillment, meaning, and I might add, the possibility of wondrous love. Because that, that is what has given birth to this very planet upon which we live and each of our lives. Thank you so much for letting me share these thoughts with you. And have a great, great conference and bring the lessons learned 
into action. Thank you. Protect our planet is really started from Dr. R. K. Petraris leading his team to get the people's awareness of our planet emergency. And thanks for your efforts. Today, we get together to remember our Dr. R. K. Petrori and to promote, to continue promote of pop movements. Here in China, we have thousands of hundreds of volunteers participate, actively involved in the pop movements. And we are here to take this opportunity on behalf of China Biodiversity Conservation and the Green Development Foundation and uh, with all our team in China, we would like to congratulate your great uh, events and uh, we would like to learn after the events and uh, will follow, will participate to continue our journey of pop moments. Thank you. Hello everybody. My name is John Porter. I'm talking to you from Denmark, from just outside Copenhagen in Denmark. And, uh, Ashpachari has uh, has asked me to say a few words about his his father, uh, Rajinda Prachari, uh, who was always known within IPCC as uh, Pachi. And um, I'm delighted to be able to respond to that request from Ash, because his father was an exceptional person, and I think he fits quite nicely into the 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 idea of of trying to engage young people. Because even though he was a very senior man, he always had a twinkle in his eye. Um, and so he, he was a person who was quite old, but was really young at heart. His, his heart and his brain were, were, were young. And, um, and that was part of his success as being so involved in the IPCC. Um, if I speak personally about him, I met him first in, um, Tsukuba in, in, uh, in Japan. When we were starting the the fifth assessment report for the IPCC, and um, he had a great uh, ability as a leader. I mean, what makes a good leader? Well, a good leader is someone who 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 is able to galvanize people, to bring them together, to make them feel important, and to make them feel confident, and to be courteous and interested and polite. And he did so much traveling around, but he still always had that ability to engage with people. The um, second time I think I saw him was in in San Francisco. We had a meeting of the IPCC um, fifth assessment group in in San Francisco. And um, yes, he was also a very elegant man. He turned up with his black Homburg on, which was his archetypal headgear. And uh, again, he was doing the, 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 doing the rounds, engaging with people, going to chat people making people feel good and important to do this kind of work, because this was really crucial work we were doing. And the, and the final time I saw him was, was in Tsukuba, in, it, in, uh, in Japan, where we had the final summary for, for um, policymakers meeting in Tsukuba in, uh, in, in Japan. And, and these, these events were very political. And, and I remember Apache getting very frustrated with the delegates and and because some of the delegates were basically trying to rewrite what the scientists had written and he stormed he, he had his fist and he said this report was written by the scientists and not by the delegates and um, that made a big impression i think because after that everybody started behaving themselves and uh, so he, he was a man also of enormous um in danish would say pondus with enormous uh, uh presence presence he had a good presence and um, and then towards the end of his life, I, I had some very nice interactions with him. Um, particularly, he was interested in food security, and I was the person who led the, the chapter on food security in the fifth assessment report. And so we had a lot of correspondence, actually. And he invited me to attend uh, one of the World um, Development Forums in uh, in Mexico, uh, where I was delighted to be. So 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 he he. Um, Pachi and, and, and also he had a, we, we did on a personal note, we did share a great love of cricket. Um, uh, I play cricket in the UK at a reasonably high level. And I think he had a, a cricket pitch at Terry in, in, in India. And I would love to have had a game of cricket with him, but unfortunately that was not to be. Um, but I still have 
you know, ideas about how it might have been. Okay, so Ash and, uh, and everybody, I, I'm delighted, as I said, to offer these few words for, for your father. Uh, he was an exceptional person. Um, he, he commanded enormous respect from the whole of the IPCC community. And uh, and he died, you know, he, he, he died far too young. We need people like your father uh, for, for now and also in the future. So all the best for your conference. I'm sorry I can't be there. Um, I don't do so much traveling anymore as an emeritus professor. Um, but uh, anyway, I do hope you have a great time with the conference. And, 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 and remember Rajendra Pachari or Pachi as we always knew him. Thank you very much. Ash, thank you for allowing me to speak at this highly prestigious conference on the pop movement, and especially to celebrate the life and passion of your father, Dr. R.K. Pachori. Like Pachi, I am also a physicist by training, and hence always curious about new technology and the people who drive innovation, which is the lifeblood of our planet. Meeting Pachi for the first time in Delhi, I was captivated by his energy, curiosity, and devotion to dealing with the issues of our finite Earth-based resources. Water, energy, and humanity were his hallmarks. We immediately bonded, and when I explained that I was looking for a, a new interesting technology to help launch a new business, he immediately pointed to the concept of microbial enhanced oil recovery as a way to stretch out the limits of fossil fuel production without damaging the environment. It seemed unique, and together we started a new company based in Houston, Texas, to go forward. That company we called Glory Oil, and it eventually became a public enterprise. Patchy moved to a larger stage at the United Nations and became the recipient of the Nobel Prize on behalf of the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change which was the pinnacle of his success. But Patchy was always the same person and never allowed the recognition to overshadow his own humble personality. Combining innovation with a respect for science and a desire to improve the state of the world for all of us was his legacy that still lives today. Congratulations and best wishes for a successful conference. Hello everyone, my name is Andreas and it's a pleasure for me to send you greetings from the pop movement team here in Germany. So um, I hope you already had a good start with the international conference and the pop festival. And uh, once again, it's a pleasure to send a few sentences to you. So um, the start of the pop movement team here in Germany was uh, arranged by a meeting with the, the late Dr. Pachauri. Um, on, in a very funny way, so um, I took a geography class of mine many years ago to a um, crazy trip to Kazakhstan. That was a, the expo with the um, topic um, sustainability. And uh, I never met Dr. Pachauri before. And a researcher from Germany said, oh, you, I, I get you linked up uh, with him. Um, so he put me, took me uh, to this VIP uh, area where I met Dr. Pachari and that was very uh, impressive because uh, he already left all the high educated people there with their suits and uh, said no there is a, a teacher and there are some students waiting outside for me and he left the VIP area and um, talked to us yeah so that was very impressive and after his meeting here at our school in Germany a few months later we um, started the pop movement team and the sustainability work at the school, which is still running. So it's still for a few years now. Um, I hope you have a wonderful conference and uh, it will be wonderful um, if the results of the conference um, will work on. So um, there's nothing more bad or boring if you leave a conference and you have good ideas, but you're not able to take them over into action. So this is my hope and um, this is my, my wish to you, to the youth, um, that you really take part in this sustainability work and think about how to 
um, have these ideas maybe which are created at the conference to make it yeah, to make it in real life. And I think one big topic is the question how to move the elderly people, how to move the adults. Um, and I would be absolutely happy if you have any good conclusions in that because moving adults is really a big stone that you have to um, keep rolling or start rolling. So um, I keep my fingers crossed, wishing you all the best, have a good conference and I'm very happy to get in contact with you. So um, we have the uh, website pop-movement.de for the German team and um, yeah, let's work. It's it's in your hands. Bye for now. Hi, dear friends. I'm Wen Tian, a youth mentor from Pop Movement. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to the 2024 International Conference and Pop Festival for the Youth Lead Climate Action. Today, we are gathered together to celebrate the spirit of climate leadership and to share our initiatives, actions, and innovations aimed at addressing the pressing issue of climate change, which is one of the most significant challenges facing in our world today. Dear friends, I am Ludo Dils. I'm professor at Antwerp University and consultant for VITO and the European Commission, where I advise about the process industry transition. As I was a good friend and strongly inspired by Dr. Rachenda Pachauri, it is a great honor for me to speak to you today. Dr. Pachauri opened the eyes and later also the doors of many people to become concerned about the impact of climate change on the daily life of the citizens of our planet and especially on the most vulnerable living already in unhealthy and unsafe conditions. Therefore, I invite you youngsters to take the future in your hand and to work not for yourself, but all together to combat climate change. This can be done by reducing and changing our consumption pattern on one end and by developing and fully deploying new processes and technologies in a race against the clock on the other end. Always there is a lot of discussion about which technology should be the winner, but please, we need it all and especially we need the innovations in an integrated manner, making new value chains all with the same target doing it in an environmental friendly, climate neutral and circular way. We need the transition towards a vision and the pathways to this transition are uncertain. So do not blame someone if he or she tried but failed. It is part of the transition action. Every step, every trial counts and at the end we must integrate it all. I invite you to evaluate via the POP movement what would best work particularly in your country and in your case. But I also invite you not to stop at the level of discussion, but to act, to walk your talk. And to make it tangential, I invite you all to join the 7th GSTIC conference that will take place from 22 to 24 October here in Delhi and which is, will be organized by Terry together with an international consortium. So I really trust on you and please do not leave anyone behind. Thank you so much and success. Hi, my name is Steve Killalay. I'm the founder and the executive chairman of the Institute for Economics and Peace. We set up to understand the intersection between business, peace and economics, place special interests on metrics to measure peace and then to ascribe an economic value to changes in peace. One of the reports we do is called the Ecological Threat Report. And this is very, very relevant when it comes to climate change. So I must admit, I'm very proud to be presenting at your conference there on climate change and peace. I wish I was there in person, but I'm afraid on exactly that same day, I'm speaking at a large conference in London. So it's impossible to be in two places at once. But let's think about climate change and the way it affects the environment. So what climate change does is it degrades the ecology. And so that's the way, in the long run, it manifests through shocks in society. So there's a strong linkage between ecological degradation and peace, uh, which I'm now going to go into a little bit more detail. So I guess first up, what do I mean by the concept of ecology? And so I'm really talking about the availability and access to water, the ability to have the access also to food and the right level of food to have a nutritional life. I'm talking about 
impact of cyclones, talking about the impacts of hurricanes, talking about the impacts of drought, and also tied up in our concepts of the ecology's overpopulation. Because once an environment gets overpopulated, then obviously it can't sustain the uh, level of the population anymore and the ecology degrades. So as climate change increases, so will the potential for these ecological shocks to occur. And we'd expect over the next 50 years it to be progressively worse. But even if we look at it today, there are many areas of the world which are suffering from major ecological degradation at major levels of stress. Now, for societies, what happens, many of them have a level of societal resilience. And if the societal resilience is strong enough, then they're able to absorb shocks. So let's think about that for a minute. So as climate change increases, let's say droughts get severe, water becomes scarcer, that now affects food. Now that's, if you like, an ecological shock. But the resilience or the societal resilience of the country or the community will determine whether it can absorb that shock or not. Now, the good news is we can also measure societal resilience and us at the Institute for Economics and Peace have a series of research, which we call Positive Peace, which measures the ability of societies to be able to absorb the ecological shocks. Now, what we do is we take the ecological threat report and take the countries with the most severe shocks and then combine that with the levels of their societal resilience. And from that, we're able to predict which countries in the world are likely to have the worst ecological shocks. Now, there's also a very, very strong tie-in between this and conflict. So now if we're looking at the areas of the world where the most threats result, that's in sub-Saharan Africa by far. We're looking at two out of every three countries, which we'd call a hotspot country, that they lie in sub-Saharan Africa. If you've got portions of the Middle East, and then areas also in South Asia, such as Afghanistan. We've got 30 countries which we isolate as these hotspot countries. When we look at them, all bar a few are actually suffering from conflict. And what it shows is there's a direct correlation between conflict, ecological shocks, and we can see with climate change, it actually affects the intensity of the shocks as well. So we came around to, let's say, India. Now, I realise you're all in Delhi, at your conference there in India. So we come around to India. There are a number of states there which are what we'd see having severe risk. And these are Assam, Bihar, Gurukhet, and Odisha. So they're the four provinces within India which we think are likely to face the most severe issues. Uh, however, the resilience within, the societal resilience within those uh, states is better than what it is in many other parts of the world. But if we're looking forward and we're looking at India today, I think there's two things I think we really need to think about. Is that first is water. So if we look, and it's no secret to anyone in the audience here, that if we look at India, the water tables in India are dropping dramatically. Over the next five years, there's going to be a number of water crises in different parts of the in, in India. And we're already familiar with stories of having water trains which travel 150 kilometres daily in the middle of the, uh, the dry season to be able to stock cities with adequate water. And the other issue is population. India's got the largest population in the world now. It's overtaken China as China's population drops. And so the ecological threat from overpopulation is really acute. But one of the facts not many people really know is that the actual population of India now is starting to stabilise. So the birth rate uh, for each woman is 2.2 children per child. So that's roughly at equilibrium. Now, what I'd like to... If you like this presentation, there's a lot of work which IEP does. And so you're most welcome to go out, go to our websites, visionofhumanity.com or economicsandpeace.com. We've got multiple websites. And we also have a lot of on trainings as well. We've had online positive peace training courses and more in-depth IEP ambassador training courses, which is a three-week course. We've now trained about 3,000 ambassadors globally. We take new intakes every six months. Look, enjoy your conference. I honestly wish I was there. It sounds like it's going to be a great few days, and thank you for listening to me. I got to know Dr. Pachori, whom we used to all used to call Patchy, um, as long back as in the early 1980s. 
and the reason was that he was among the very earliest people in, in, in India in the energy field to recognize that the days of fossil fuels were coming to, to an end and that we had, we had to move out of them quite soon. And he was really among the very pioneers and one of the first conferences that, that he held happened to be in Agra and he had been writing something in the, in, in the newspapers and he, which he had read. So he invited me to come in and be a participant, not even particularly a speaker. Uh, I got to know Dr. Pichauri quite well after that and I noticed that he was a very quietly successful man and the reason was, as I found out the more, the more I got to know him, was that he had very little ego in him. He was supremely capable, he understood things very rapidly but also at the same time he never worried about how someone else's understanding of something or doing well in something in, 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 a, in a field in which he's himself interested might affect him. That was not the interest. For him the issue was all important. We were there to serve and Dr. Pachori was there to serve. Now, this, this particular characteristic is not easily found in organizations like the Tata Energy Research Institute or any other organization. It's not in, it's, it's in fact an uncommon one generally in, in, in human beings, particularly nowadays. He had it in loads which might, is probably the reason why he was chosen over and over again to be a part of major organizations, among, among others, before he joined the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, he was a, a member of the board of the International Association of Energy Economics, which is a Washington-based organization. It's a very, big, a very, very well-known, very old organization. But uh, Pachi was, was there too, and he was very highly regarded. Pachi, uh, I, I once talked to him, I think it's the shaping. We have now had, I think, six uh, you know, IPCC assessment reports. The most important ones were third, which were before he joined, but more than, more than that, even the fourth assessment report, which was the first one that he personally, in a sense, directed. 2,500 scientists worked on it, but the point is you had to bring them together, and then you had to bring together about 120 governments to a consensus. It's a monumental task and he once told me it was just one of the most difficult things he's ever done to get people to accept that they had a common a common core of, a core of common interests when there were so many things that divided them in other ways and that is what the the, the climate the IPCC fourth fourth assessment report showed he developed a technique for presenting all views within a consensus which has now been followed in every single report after that now that he has gone, all I can say to the young people of, of, of India and of the world is be like him, try and be like him. Don't think of yourselves, don't think of financial gains, think of gains to society. And this is particularly important in the area of renewable energy because there, the, there are short term losses for those who are already invested in conventional energy sources and the, the spin off technologies which use them. But we need to remember those who will be the, the gainers from shifting out and think of them and act on their behalf when we promote the, the move into uh, non-fossil energy, which must be done very, very soon in the future. Thank you. Our world is in peril from global warming and climate change. You know, every day we're seeing the records broken in terms of temperature rise right around the world. The warnings of the scientists are now the reality for so many people as they face catastrophic weather events such as floods and bushfires and tornadoes and hurricanes. So I guess my plea to the young people of the world is that you can make a difference. We have to work together in order to convince the governments of the world to do the right thing by the planet, to think long term, not short term. You know, I had the great privilege of being a friend of Dr. Pachuri, a very good friend. He was also a hero. Few people in the world have made the difference that he did in warning the planet about what was happening, but also 
giving us a blueprint on how to tackle it. So please get involved. Get involved in the environmental movement. Get involved through organisations such as POP, P-O-P. And I'm really proud to support Ash Pachuri, Dr Pachuri's son, in this important endeavour for our planet. So please, young people, we need your wisdom because the older generations have failed you. We can do this. We can prevent catastrophic global warming, but only if we act now and devote our lives to doing so. Thank you. Greetings from Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States of America. My name is Mariana Grossman. I'm on the unceded lands of the Multnomah, the Clackamas, and Gran Ron tribes, as well as others. I've been working to advance sustainability and climate solutions for much of my life, I'm sorry my generation has not done more to transition to a regenerative and just culture and society. Your work and your stories are so important in bringing hope and encouragement to the world. Humanity has faced daunting challenges in the past, and we have made enormous progress. I believe it is important to celebrate what is working and to be grateful for the miracles and love that surround us every day. Together, we can transform the world. Thank you. World leaders youth diplomats, activists, those joining virtually, and those present. All protocols observed. Usa locally. Nibonrish kai mandire. Kasike yukaike yame wanidaka. Ikonye wakia yaka wamun woperitun. Wailinu. Ubo. In my indigenous language, what I said is, greetings, good morning relatives. My name is Nibon Rish Kaima and I am chief of the Jamaican Hummingbird Taino people. And we are here today to talk about and to share about our future generations, focusing on those who came before us. To all of those present at the Pop Festival, I would like to share with you the importance of respecting, acknowledging, and putting at the forefront of our work, indigenous knowledge. The indigenous people of the world throughout are the ones who have been custodians of our environment, who hold deep wisdom teachings and medicines, who understand that everything carries a spirit and that we're all related as the two-legged ones, the people of this planet. We are the custodians that are charged with taking care of this space for the next seven generations. So 200 years from now, what will be the impact and the legacy that you all will leave? On behalf of my community, of the Jamaican Hummingbird Taino people. We share our blessings for this event and we wish that POP will continue to protect our planet and Hankatu, and so it is. Hello everyone, I hope you're having an amazing time at the POP Festival. My name is Anna Hanhausen. I've been a part of the POP family since 2019. And this is actually the first time that I'm not joining the POP Festival live and that I'm joining through video, which makes me a little sad. I wish I could see everyone soon, but hope that happens next year. And I just hope you really enjoy this event and that you make amazing connections, collaborations and friendships that will last a lifetime. I actually met the POP family, as I said, in 2019 through my work in Cambio, where we conducted different sustainability activities in the University Ibero in Mexico City. And through there, my relationship with POP has really grown and they've been able to support many of the projects that I've worked with. And I've really grown a lot as a person and as a professional thanks to POP. I was able to conduct many sessions on the POP Ocean branch of the POP movement, where we brought youth from all across the world who were interested in ocean conservation to learn more about what they could do to help the ocean. We conducted workshops, we conducted webinars, seminars, and brought together people from all across the world, from Korea, Australia, Venezuela, different parts of Europe, Mexico, and really the, to learn more about ocean literacy and how different actions can impact directly on the ocean. So it was an amazing project. And I was also a part of the incredible project called Leadership Conversations, where we interviewed leaders from all across the world, from different sectors and different backgrounds to know what leadership meant to them and what were their tips that they could give the youth so that we could increase our leadership skills. This was an amazing project. We were able to get information from people from many, many different sectors, and it was very rich for, for all the youth who were able to participate in this. So I really appreciate being able to be part of that project. The POP family has really supported the project that I'm in, which I will talk a little bit more in a few seconds, uh, which is called WIDU. From the very beginning where we started thinking about the idea 
I, having the support of the pop family right there next to me has been amazing. They've really led me through creating the most effective path to create a difference. At WeDo, what we do is promote sustainable action and citizen-led community through NAC. We develop a calculator focused mainly on, on Mexican citizens, and we develop an app that helps people understand what are some of the most effective actions that they can take to reduce their impact. We were able to connect with many organizations, student groups, universities, and everything to bring this project to life. It's actually, the app is now live on the App Store since a couple of years ago, and this never would have been possible without pop support. So I just really want to I have this opportunity to give a really huge thank you to the whole pop family and to everyone who has been there every step of the way in order to make WeDo an impactful project. We're, what we're doing right now with WeDo is we're finding additional ways in which we can effectively promote citizen-led climate action. We realized that we had a lot of information on sustainability in our app, but many people for different reasons weren't able to download it. Maybe they didn't have space on their phone or not enough internet connection, or maybe there were kids in primary school who didn't have access to, to, a, to a smartphone, right? So what we are working on with students from my university actually is creating a manual for climate action. So basically what you see on the app, now you can see it on a manual where you can see the impact of your lifestyle and what are the most important actions that you can take, not only personally, but also with your community to reduce this impact and support conservation and support the, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. We are also working on promoting um, different actions within companies. We help create sustainability challenges with employees in order to enhance how they promote sustainability within their workplace, which has also been amazing. And we've been able to meet people who are doing incredible things. And as I mentioned, none of this would have been possible without the support and the kickstart that Pop gave us and all the mentorship that we gained from them. So to everyone who's here for the first time or who hasn't been here for many sessions with the Pop family, I really hope you make the most out of it. You'll learn so much and you'll make amazing friendships that will last a lifetime. And I hope I get to meet you soon. And thank you so much for allowing me to participate via video. As I said, I hope I can join live for the next sessions. And I can't wait to continue growing the different projects, increasing ocean awareness through Pop Ocean, continuing with the leadership conversations in order to enhance these conversations that help the youth be equipped with the necessary skill set to become leaders themselves, and also to continue growing with you and promote sustainable sustainability and citizen-led climate action in my country and beyond. So thank you so much. A big hug to everyone, and I hope I get to see you soon. Good morning. I'm... Uh... Deeply sorry for not being able to be present here, but I would like to convey that message from Bamako in Mali. Uh, at memory of Dr. R.T. Pachori. Dr. Pachori was a renowned international leader and an energy and expert on all issues related to human well being, poverty eradication, energy, and international development. His work addresses some of the biggest challenges of our time, climate change, energy systems, and sustainable development. He has made an outstanding contribution to the links between the science, engineering, social science, political science, economics, and the use of knowledge to inform early policy and decision-making and support practice at different levels. In a couple of years, I've seen Dr. Pachori had succeeded in transforming the small institute that was Terry into one of the largest and best known energy research groups, applying sustainable development principles in an empire that combined research, knowledge, training, and practice. It is a place to be, Terry is a place to be for anyone interested in sustainable development when he instituted the annual daily sustainable development forum. Dr. Pachori mentored and coached numerous of young researchers from Asia, Latin America, Europe, Africa, North America, and who are making a major impact in the area of research and policy. He had a direct, thoughtful approach in guiding researchers into his supervision as he motivated them to raise their game 
and ambition in their research. He not only contributed to awareness of the largest research, but empower and energize his colleagues making the research ecosystem richer and better prepared to deal with future challenges. In supporting and mobilizing the youth, he launched the Protect Our Planet movement, known as uh, POP, in 2016 as a transformational platform for action. Dr. Pachori was a global player. His work on energy, sustainability, and climate change has had a significant impact globally and influenced academics worldwide. He was always himself, whether with a head of the state, the head of an international organization, a CEO of a big company, or a street kid. He always put the human being first before the position. Thank you for your attention. Excellencies, colleagues and friends. First, I would like to thank Ash and the POP movement for the invitation to say a few words on the occasion of the International Conference and POP Festival. I'm very sorry that I cannot be with you in person and appreciate the opportunity to provide a brief pre-recorded statement. The International Conference and the POP Festival that Rajendra Pachari organized is a very appropriate occasion to celebrate the life of my dear friend Prachi. Pachi lives in our memories and also in his salient achievements and through his exemplary dedication and tireless efforts to put the world on the sustainable development pathway. This is the vision that we all need to follow. So he is with us and will continue through his legacy to show us the way despite continuing challenges ahead. I met Pachi some 30 years ago for the first time, just as he was building Terry and continued to work closely with his tireless leadership on energy and sustainable development challenges. Later, when he became the chair of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this work continued on the fourth and the fifth assessment reports, where I was also a lead author among many other colleagues. It was during Pachi's tenure that the IPCC received the Nobel Prize for Peace, a distinction that is commensurate with Pachi's monumental achievement and legacy. Pachi and I collaborated on a number of important initiatives over the past years. I would like to highlight a more personal note that we were teaching jointly a postgraduate course in Montenegro in 2019, just five years ago. Some of you may know that I'm originally from the former Yugoslavia, and it meant a lot to me that Pachi devoted so much time to work with students from Western Balkans on communicating the need to transform the world to a just and safe place without leaving anyone behind. The key question today is whether humanity will have the political will to collectively achieve this essential transformation and avoid pitfalls of my country first or my region first logic that is spreading throughout the world. It is, however, for us to choose which direction to go, as Pachi always pointed out that the sustainable future for all, is within, for all is within reach if we act decisively and in unison. The world is facing multiple crises and challenges from climate change and possible tipping of the earth systems to poverty, exclusion, wars and conflict. So we all need to join forces to overcome these dangers to people in the planet. My hope is that the top movement will continue to empower the youth to have an active participation in addressing issues of climate change faced by our planet. This will require a Herculean effort, and I'm sure that the youth will be wiser than my generation was in making sure that we achieve a just and equitable future for all and a safe and resilient planet. I wish you a very successful and inspirational international conference and pop festival. Thank you very much. Hello, wonderful people. It's a great pleasure to say hello to each one of you from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I know you're meeting in India this time, and it's a great honor to have the opportunity to share with you some words. As you probably know, I had the opportunity to meet Rajendra Pachauri, Pachi, my friend in 2009. He was an inspiration to me while well, he was working for the IPCC and Terry in India. He was the person who told me about the importance of energy efficiency and how important 
it was it, it was to change the energy system paradigm. He really did manage to do that, and he encouraged many of the leaders in different parts of the world to do that. One of the things we did at the time was the creation of the International Partnership for Energy Efficiency Cooperation. This organization, led by the leaders of most of the countries that had energy production in different ways, decided to get together and work on the opportunities of reducing energy consumption and having energy efficiency as the greatest tool. As you all know, um, our friend Pachi passed away a few years ago. I want to honor him as we have this brief discussion, this conversation, in order to remember him, in order to say how inspiring he was to me, to say how inspiring he was to many of the leaders of the world, and that his remembrance of everything he suggested and everything he did is still alive in our souls. I commend each one of you for getting together, for being the, youth po the, the, the greatest youth population committed to sustainability, committed to energy efficiency, committed to climate change, committed to the environment, in terms of looking for the different ways of trying to make our world a better world. I wish next time I have the opportunity to be with each one of you in person, and I really wish you all the best in this meeting, which I have no doubt is gonna be very, very successful. All the best. Hi, this is Eric Hansel, founder of the Scubaverse and board member for Earth Child Institute. I think that when it comes to climate action and young people, the answer is probably right in front of their faces. I think leveraging the use of technology makes it easier to engage young people in these conversations and makes it easier for them to understand what's being put in front of them. At the Scubaverse, we focus on building games and leveraging Web3 technology, NFTs, as a way to tie people to the real world from within the game. I'd like to see more young people in developing nations embrace technology and learning about how to help digitally transform their own communities so that the adaptation to climate can be quicker. So that we can use models of geographic areas to determine how likely they are to be impacted by climate and then use other models to determine what's the best way to deal with that. I'm really sorry that I couldn't be in India with all of you celebrating the pop movement and all that it does for children globally. Ash and Norma, I miss you guys very much. And I'll see you when you're back in New York. I love you. Ashi 垃圾的排放
这些问题，通过 POP， 通过各种环保活动，国际的、社区的，可以经常性的提醒我们，可以不断的增加我们减排的知识。最近的这个气候问题更加突出。气象组织已经预测了， 2024年将会又一次刷新世界最热的记录。事实上，接下来的可能几十年，每一年都会是最热的一年，所以问题已经很紧迫了。不论是极端气候，还是海平面上涨，不论是农业减产，还是生命财产的损失，我们每一个人都应该有极为强烈的忧患意识。我们古人说。人无远虑，必有近忧。我们要把人类未来的这个危机放在心上，只有时时刻刻放在心上，我们人类的物质、人类的生存、人类的安全才能有保障。非常迫切，所以 POP 的这些活动是极为有意义的。今年二月三号在新德里的这个活动，我如果有时间，我都想去，只是因为我在做的风力发电的这个开发呢。太忙，啊、哦，我用的是铝合金的风力发电机，完全没有没有垃圾的，难度太大，所以没有时间。所以下一次我力争能够参加 POP 的活动，预祝 POP 的本次活动圆满成功。谢谢。Well, hello everyone at this year's Pop Festival. Thanks for keeping the legacy of the late Dr. Pachari alive. A true visionary who understood the power of you, the nearly two billion Jews in the world. Tackling the issues of climate change, biodiversity destruction, inequality, etc. Although emissions are still going up, you've proven to be able to bend the curve. It might all not always feel like it, but you have, as young generation. The job now is to simply accelerate it. You have more power in your hands than young people had at any moment in history. Make your voices heard. As a political voice, especially in 2024, a pivotal year where more than half of the world population is going to the polls, you also have an economic voice. Make your money count. As employees, make your employment count. And as innovators and as value creators, we need to use whatever power and leverage we have in the fight for a fairer, safer, more inclusive, and more equitable world. No matter what you do, be led by these three simple questions. The first one: Am I standing up for the basic human values on which all of our future depends? Dignity, equality, inclusion, justice for all. Secondly, am I ambitious enough in setting the right audacious goals? And thirdly, am I working with others together on something bigger than I can do alone? Never before have humanity's challenges demanded such collaboration within and across our societies. Collaborative. Versus competitive leadership is what is needed now. I know it doesn't always feel like it, but these are tremendous days to be young. Together, we have an opportunity to shape the future, save the planet, and change the course of humanity. What if our best world is still ahead of us? The only impossible journey is the one that we never begun. To those who tell us that it can't be done, you are on the wrong side. Of history, let's find our hope, find our energy, and find each other. Keep going, never give up. Thank you very much. I met Professor Pachauri at a conference dedicated to sustainable development at Montenegrin Academy of Science and Arts around ten years ago. Actually, I was interested in information given by moderator that one of the panelists. Is a Nobel Prize winner, Nobel laureate, coming to Montenegro with no fuss, it seemed impossible to me. The speech of Professor Pachauri was not just full of expertise; the tone of his voice suggested a person of good heart. Thus, I approached him and we discussed. As a rector of the University of Donja Gorica, as leading founder of that university. I suggested him <coughs> directly to visit our university next morning. He accepted my invitation immediately. In the meantime, I elected my young, younger colleagues to prepare everything for meeting with Professor Pachauri. There were fifteen of them in this office. 
Every one of them read Professor uh, biography and his speeches. He was pleasantly surprised. This meeting lasted for three hours. We agreed that we proceed with uh, a pop movement and to include Professor Pachauri in the research and teaching at UDG. He visited UDG two times and held several lectures and discussions. Students loved him. He invited us for a conference in Mexico in 2018. He laid the foundations for the prof uh, professional development of Center for Climate Change, Natural Resources and Energy of UDG. We fondly remember Professor Pachori and we would like to continue collaboration with his family, his institute and environmental movement. It is in Montenegrin culture to never forget true friendship but to respect them inheritably. All the best to Pachori family and to all participants of this manifestation. Regard from Montenegro, good luck. Ash, I wish your father, Dr. R.K. Pachori, were alive and well and with us today, and I wish he was there at the Habitat Center when the pop festival unfolds for all the young people that have to live with the mistakes that my generation has made. Things are not beyond control now. They are not beyond solution. The fact is that sitting in this very room with me, I recall Patchy saying that the tiger behind me is nothing but a symbol for all of nature, a metaphor. And that if we were to protect the creatures of the world, the biodiversity of the world, the climate will look after itself. Such learnings are not exactly difficult to teach, um, but they are very difficult to implement, as we all know. Nevertheless, there is one thing that Patchy and me both agreed on. Nature was always asking us to kneel in prayer. Soon it will ask us to kneel in subjugation. We still have time, just about that much time. Patchy, I think they'll make it. We're in the departure lounge now. We just got to make that arrival lounge a little more hospitable, a little more safe, a little more happy. And that's what Ash is trying to do today. Hello, my name is Lance Inyon, and I had the great pleasure of knowing Dr. Pachari. I started out as his media consultant, and then we became great friends. Everything you need to know about Dr. Pachari was in his nickname, Patchy. He, he asked everyone to call him Patchy, and it was a sign of how extremely unpretentious he was, how he could talk to anyone. He was just as comfortable talking to a 21-year-old climate activist as he was a 70-year-old uh, climate czar uh, in some country around the world. And that's one of the many things I loved about him. There was one kind of person, though, he didn't like talking to. He confided this in me. And those were the extreme, loud, vociferous climate deniers, especially the ones who got paid to deny climate. Those he didn't like. Everyone else, he loved them. And he loved the idea that we could work our way out of this climate crisis by harnessing the power and enthusiasm of youth, which is why he started the pop movement. I salute him for that. I salute all of you for joining in that movement. And here's to Patchy. I'm Gary Jacobs, president of the World Academy of Art and Science. And I'm pleased to participate in this international conference and POP festival for Youth-Led Climate Action 2024. WAS has been the collaborating partner with POP from the time that Dr. Rajendra Pachuri first joined the board of the trustees of the Academy about seven years ago. It's an honor to participate in an event inspired by the work of Pachi, dedicated to him, and carried on by his son Ash Pachuri and the dedicated team at POP Movement. Was is pleased to be a collaborating partner. Catalyzing climate action and building collective resolve is critically important for attaining the UN Sustainable Development Goals, leaving no one behind. Especially the emphasis being placed on mobilizing youth and women-led initiatives. I'm particularly pleased to participate in an event that focuses on human security for everyone on Earth. About 18 months ago, the World Academy joined in partnership with the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security on a global campaign we call Human Security for All, HS4A. And we're pleased to have POP Movement as one of our partners in the campaign. Climate is related to all dimensions of human security, 
food security, economic security, political security, the security of community, individual security, ecological security, and also health security. A few months ago, WHO published data showing that climate is the single greatest threat to health for everyone on Earth. According to international surveys, the medical profession enjoys the greatest public trust of any occupation in the world. That means medical doctors have a unique opportunity to work for climate change by publicly voicing their support for climate action. What is true for medical profession is also true for other professions. We are all in this together. We must all commit ourselves to work for human security for all. I particularly appreciate the focus in this event on the arts. Arts are the universal language for people to communicate with each other. My thanks to Ash Pachuri and POP for organizing this important event and wish you great success in this endeavor. Thank you. Mm -hmm.